Hello, welcome to the ninth lecture of the Asian Development Bank 3IE Impact Evaluation video lecture series. Today I am going to be talking about impact evaluation of health programs and projects. Let's start with defining what an impact evaluation is. I'm sure by now all of you are familiar with impact evaluations. However, if you would like to know more about this in details, I would like you to refer to the first video of these lecture series. Impact evaluation measures net changes in an outcome for a particular group of people that can be attributed to a specific program using the best available methodology. Now here, let's focus on a few keywords. The first word is measurement. This implies that impact evaluation is a quantitative exercise. The second is net change, which means that impact evaluation is looking at changes over time. The third important word is attributed. Attributed implies a causal relationship. Essentially, an impact evaluation is trying to answer the question that does program X cause some percent change in outcome Y? And finally, the phrase mess methodology is important because this implies that there is more than one way of doing an impact evaluation and 3IE firmly believes in the use of experimental and quasi-experimental methods to conduct impact evaluations. Now moving on to the next topic of impact evaluations in health. Here I would like to highlight the measurement aspects. Now health outcomes can be measured using a number of different ways but some of the commonly used ways include anthropometric measures such as height, weight, upper arm circumference, the second important way is doing blood testing or other biometric methods. So this could involve HIV testing or um, other ways. And finally, you also have uh, mortality. So mortality can again be measured like maternal mortality or child mortality. Another important point to keep in mind is that for many programs, the ultimate objective might be to change mortality say for example maternal mortality but maternal mortality is not easy to measure and you actually require a large population to get these estimates so in that case it's important to get to measure intermediary outcomes and a strong theory of change can really be very important in identifying what those inter intermediary outcomes will be so for example in the case of maternal mortality we might actually be able to measure how many women actually gave birth in uh, proper facilities and we also might be able to measure how many women actually went to antenatal clinics during their pregnancy. I would now like to use a case study to illustrate how an impact evaluation of a health program is actually done. And I am using a 3IE funded study that looked at increasing the adoption of male circumcision in Malawi. Before I begin with the actual uh, evaluation, I would like to say a little bit about the context. So around 40 million people around the world are infected with HIV. Of these, majority are residing in sub-Saharan Africa. Evidence from randomized controlled trials shows that male circumcision can actually prevent the spread of HIV infection. But what we need to now know is that what can countries and policymakers do to improve the demand of voluntary male medical circumcision in these countries? This particular study aims to fill the gaps in knowledge about the adoption of voluntary male medical circumcision. Specifically, it aims to answer two important questions. The first important question is, does the demand for male circumcision vary according to the price? And the second is that does information about male circumcision and its relationship to HIV influence the take up or adoption of male circumcision? Now, how did the evaluators go about answering these two questions? So the over here, I would like to pause and say a little bit about the evaluation design used by the study. So the study used a randomized controlled trial in which, the in, in which the unit of randomization was at the individual level. Now, what does that mean? So here, I would like to say that for any impact evaluation, it's very important to focus on three important questions, which is what is the unit of assignment? What is the unit of treatment and what is the unit of analysis? Now, if you want more details about this, I would request you to refer to lecture three of this video series. But I will say a little bit about the different randomization techniques. So here in this particular study, they used randomization at the individual level, which means that male A got the treatment and male B did not get the treatment. So it happened at an individual level.
But there is one more way of doing this and that is you can do it at a group level or at a cluster level, which basically means that instead of randomizing individuals, you randomize groups such as schools or village. So village A gets the intervention and village B does not get the intervention. And these cluster level randomization is also very common for impact evaluations of health programs. However, this study was doing the randomization at the individual level. The next important question is what is the unit of treatment? Now once again the treatment can be done at the individual level which was the case in this case that is individual males were given, the in, were given information and discount vouchers but it can also be done at, the, at a higher level. For example if, you're, if you have a cluster randomization at the school level then you can be assigning the treatment to the principals of that school. Finally, it's the unit of analysis. Most commonly, even if, it's there, if, even if there is a cluster randomization study, the unit of analysis is usually the individual. That is, you're going to get, collect the data at the individual level and analyze it at that level. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the project area and where the study actually took place. So the study took place in the capital of Malawi, Lilongwe. In this particular city, the, specifically they chose a the location of a working class neighborhood which was near the catchment area of the partner clinic. Now this is an important point to make because when researchers and programmers decide which location to choose within a broad country, it can be done on the basis of different reasons. So over here it was a logistical reason because the partner clinic which is going to provide the male circumcision services was located in a particular area, they chose that. But we can also have other reasons, for example one can select an area which has high incidence of HIV for example. Now within this area once you have earmarked then the sampling of people from within that area becomes very important. How do you actually because you can't collect data from each and every person living in that area. So what for, so over here it's really important to understand the sampling technique and here they used a random sampling technique. So what they did was that within this neighborhood, they divided it according to census enumeration areas. This was done randomly. From within these census enumeration areas, they randomly selected neighborhood blocks. And then finally, males between 18 to 35 years of age were selected randomly from these blocks. But it's very important to note that both men who would be assigned to the control arm and to the treatment arm came from the same block. So this is about random sampling and this is different from randomization which I will be talking about in my next slide. Now I would like to give you an overview of the randomization and the study rollout. So the first thing that was done was that 1634 uncircumcised men were selected to be a part of the study. How the selection of these men was done I have already explained in the previous slide. With these men, a baseline survey was administered. What a baseline survey essentially does is that it asks questions on some important factors and outcomes before the study starts. So you basically want to know what was the status of the study population before the program was rolled out. And that is why a baseline survey is conducted. Once the baseline survey was conducted, all the men, all the 1634 men were then given discount vouchers and this was done in a random way and the value of these discount vouchers varied. So someone could actually get a discount of 100% which means that they would have the procedure absolutely free and then someone could have also got a discount which was as low as 50 Malawian Kavacha. Then of all of these 1634 men, half were divided into the treatment arm and half were divided into the control arm. What that means is that half of these men actually got an information intervention in which these men were given comprehensive information about the relationship between HIV and male circumcision, how this particular procedure is actually done and so on and so forth, whereas that other group did not get any information. So this was essentially the design of the study. One year after this, the investigators once again went and conducted a follow-up survey, which means that the same individuals were then asked questions on pretty much the same indicators one year later. Let's now talk about what we found from the study. So this particular graph actually shows that if there are different values of discounts, then how does the circumcision behavior actually change? And what we find from this study is actually that there is not much difference in terms of actual circumcision. But what you found, find different is the interaction with the clinics. Now interaction with the clinic means that a person who got the discount voucher actually went to the clinic to get information and counseling about circumcision. So even though they did not actually get the circumcision done, but they actually went to the clinic to find out more about the procedure. 
but we find that this is actually there's a relationship between going to the clinic and the discount that they got so this is what this particular slide shows the next slide actually shows that people who got the information and those who did not is there any difference between the circumcision rates again we see that there's not much difference Overall in the study, the circumcision rates were very low, about 4%. And we also find that there is no difference between those who got the information and who, those who did not get the information. Both of these look pretty similar to each other. Next, I would like to say that the, uh, the investigators did not stop here. This is a mixed method study and it also had a strong qualitative component. Now, qualitative component is really important. And in this particular case, it's further more important because you want to understand why did the people why did information and price change not have any effect on actual circumcision? So the investigators conducted in-depth interviews with 64 males, out of which some were the ones who had got circumcision after one year and some were the ones who had not got circumcision. So the interviews revealed several interesting findings. The first was opportunity costs. So it turns out that if you go and get a circumcision procedure done, then you're not able to go for work for one week. And this is a huge cost, especially for men that come from a, that come from a family where they are the sole earners. Another important point that they found was that fear of the procedure is actually a huge barrier. So a lot of people did not want to go and get this procedure done because they were afraid. The third important point was availability of accurate information. So it was found that when a person, even if they decide to go for this procedure, if they go and talk to their friends, and there are a lot of rumors floating around, which then scares them from going ahead with the procedure. And finally, there was unreliability of the service provision. What this means is that when individuals who took up circumcision had to go multiple times to the clinic to get this procedure done, it was not very straightforward. So these are some of the key barriers. So what can we basically conclude from the study? So one important conclusion was that the adoption of male circumcision does not vary by price or information and that these are not enough to change the barriers for getting the circumcision done. This is a very important finding because what this means is that if policymakers are actually interested in using this as a strategy for preventing HIV, then they have to think of other demand generation activities that would actually make people go and get this procedure done. Now I would like to conclude with some final thoughts about impact evaluations in health. First important point is that impact evaluations in health are a necessity. I cannot emphasize this point enough. This is because so much money is spent on health programs and it's really important to know whether they're actually effective and whether people are actually even adopting them. And so impact evaluations can actually guide policymakers about the allocation of resources. So for example, in this study, if the study had not been done, what if the donors had come in with the idea of subsidizing voluntary male circumcision that would have still not made people go and get this procedure done? Finally, I would like to say that this study also highlights that non-significant findings are as important as significant findings. The word significant here implies statistically significant. So here we found that there is actually not much difference between those who got the information and those who did not in terms of actually going up, going for the procedure. But this is again a very important finding as I've already highlighted. Thank you for listening.